All right, I want to welcome everyone to the Parrot Club's June 2022 meeting. We're excited tonight to have Elizabeth Young, the founder and director of uh, Plomacy with us. And she's going to tell us about the history of Plomacy, but it is a nonprofit pigeon rescue and rehoming organization started in 2007 in the San Francisco Bay Area to address the many injured and unreleasable wild and domestic pigeons that fall through the cracks in the animal welfare network. Plomacy provides vet care, foster homes, and adoptions, has placed more than 1,500 birds, along with coaching, education, and referrals since its forming. And I've been supporting Plomacy back before it was Plomacy. I remember when Mikaku was founded as an offshoot of Mikaboo, both in San Francisco area, and then Elizabeth can certainly tell us how it be, went about becoming Plomacy and what the name Plomacy means, which is uh, has a great origin. So uh, Elizabeth is coming to us from the Bay Area tonight. Uh, I want to thank her very much for joining us to talk to us about pigeons. I know most people here have parrots, but some members of the club have pigeons or have had pigeons. And I think uh, we should all learn more about these other delightful avian creatures uh, that need rescue and need homes and all that. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Amy and everyone. I'm really honored and excited to be here. And uh, as Amy said, in 2007, uh, I the last thing I wanted to do was start a rescue. But I was volunteering at the animal shelter and I noticed these domestic pigeons were coming in, but they weren't getting any help. And they're unreleasable. And everybody else, all the other animals, the rabbits, the rats, the you know, old dogs, neonatal kittens, um, parrots, wildlife, everybody had somebody who was helping them. Um, and nobody was helping these guys. And I met one who had been a pet and she was amazing. And I knew I could find her a home. She was incredible. And so I reached out to Mickaboo because I didn't, you know, I don't know anything about bird rescue and um, Mickaboo, uh, the Bay Area Parrot Rescue was very gracious and generous. I knew about them um, as a resource for my green cheek conure and um, they basically let me create a department within their uh, organization. And that was a huge benefit. Uh, I learned so much from being sort of embedded within this big, wonderful team of bird rescuers. And it gave me instant credibility, you know, with the shelters, they knew Mickaboo. So when uh, we were Mickaboo approved, that meant, you know, we got their, their affiliation and trust and so that's how we, we went with the name Mikaku, um, since the pigeons and doves coo. And then we always joke that when they start rescuing owls, they can do Mikahu and just keep going from there. And that venture that I never intended to, to, to do, to create, continued on. I mean, you know, when, once you start rescuing, I mean, there's no end. It just gets more and more and more. And after a few years, we um, sort of grew big enough to, we call it, we fledged. We fledged from, from Mickaboo and became our own organization. And then um, the name, uh, little, you know, a little confusing, Mickaboo, Mickaboo. Um, and so, and I, I also, uh, I, I wanted to create a name that was a movement more than an organization. I wanted to create a name that could sort of outlive us. You know, if, if we stopped, it could carry on. And so Palomacy is a word that we invented. Uh, it's, what, it's what we call pigeon diplomacy. That's what we're doing. We're, pigeons, you know, you've heard like the earth needs a good lawyer. Well, pigeons need good diplomats. They, they need that. Um, there's so much prejudice against them. And so that's how we became pigeon, uh, Palomacy, Pigeon and Dove Rescue, or Pigeon and Dove Adoptions. And um, we're still a local, you know, where we serve Northern California with the birds that we actually take in to our 
care for fostering and vetting and rehoming, but we're connected with people all over the country and beyond through our Palomacy Help Group. And our volunteers do a ton of coaching and referral and answering questions. And so that's been really exciting. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that have been helping pigeons individually. And now we can kind of come together as a network, as a community. And this is Willie that I'm snuggling here. You can see he's, um, this is a, a king pigeon. He was bred for meat, for squab. And uh, he's, about, he's about four months old and he was found standing in the middle of a busy street in Daly City and um, kind family rescued him. And he was with them for a while and then he started developing some neurological symptoms. And so they took him to uh, a, a good pigeon friendly shelter and he was hospitalized there for a week, incubator, um, meloxicam, gavage feeding and everything. And he kept getting worse and worse, basically. So on May 23rd, um, we're full all the time. Palomacy, we have 165 usually uh, foster birds. We don't have a sanctuary or a, a shelter. We're all foster home and aviary based and we're always full. And um, so we really triage, we, we do our best to kind of help other people and other entities to help and, you know, kind of to build their capacity. In any case, this guy needed, he, he wasn't doing well. And it was amazing because as soon as he came out of the building, um, just the sunshine and the air and the change of environment, he started self-feeding that day. He hadn't been eating for a week, over a week, and he's been self-feeding ever since. So it's amazing how um, pigeons are really emotional and um, clinical settings are hard on them. They do a lot better in a home setting. So he's doing good now. He's, he's got a few things he's still working through, but he's he's been self-feeding ever since. And um, yeah, so that's really, and so I'm thrilled to be here and um, I'm so happy to, I love to bird nerd out. And so I'm happy to answer any questions and tell you whatever I can tell you. What, was he a squab when he was first found? Well, exactly. Well, no, so yeah, so squab in the sense of he was about four, five, six weeks old. So he was a youngster, kind of just, just fledged. Um, the squab producers collect the baby pigeons at the at 28 days old, and that's when they harvest them. And they most of them go straight to the processing plant and nobody sees them except on a very fancy gourmet plate. Um, but a portion of them are routed to live poultry markets. And that's where people buy them and either they set them free thinking they're helping them or they use them for their do-it-yourself ceremony, which, you know, either way, they can't survive. Most of them, I mean, their lifespan in the wild is, is hours to days. Um, and only the very luckiest. I mean, this guy, Willie, he, he was bred for squab meat, and instead of going to the processing plant, he got routed to a live poultry market. So he dodged that death. Then he's at the live poultry market and now people are buying birds for home butchering and you know fresh meat and everything but the person who bought him didn't kill him they let him go so he dodged death again and then he's out in the wild but he has no survival skills whatsoever they're super smart but they this bird hasn't had a, a wild ancestor for thousands of generations i mean they're completely domestic and so when that family rescued him from the middle of the street, they saved his life again. Like he's a, a real miracle bird. Wow. He's a very lucky bird. By the way, I, when you were talking about the name, 
Uh, I assume you were aware that Ploma means dove in Spanish? Yes, yes, absolutely. We, we like that. We, we like that little flare right there. I um, always assumed that's where the, the name came from. Yeah, yeah we, we lean on that pretty heavy. But it was, it was uh, we, we called what we were doing pigeon diplomacy. And that kind of turned into palomacy. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And I like it. People are doing palomacy all over the world. And, you know, it's a, it's a movement. It's not just us. It's, it's uh, pigeons need good diplomats everywhere. Well, I know I've signed a number of petitions. Uh, so I know in Spain, they're, um, they're cruelly just slaughtering pigeons because people don't like them in the city. So they're, they're using all kinds of barbaric methods to, to kill off the pigeons. So I've, I know I've signed a lot of petitions for that, but I don't think they've gone anywhere with that. People I can't, I, hate pigeons. I, I, I can't keep track um, of all the things that, I mean, hunters, there's, there's pigeon hunters, if you can imagine. Um, people who go take their shotguns and they set out pigeon decoys in farmer's fields, you know, like they get permission and um, <laughs> the pigeon flocks come in and they just blast away. They blast them, hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and they line them up uh, to spell out the number, like, and they brag about it. You know, they take pictures and show, oh my goodness, Willie, you want to be done? Willie might need to go do his own thing. He's getting, he's getting fussy. Are you okay? Um, I was, but I have a question. Please. Um, about, about your friend that you have there today, but in general, did, did you ever end up with a diagnosis uh, for him? And then my follow-up question is how much uh, have you had to deal with PMVV? Yeah, so that's, it's suspected PMV. That's exactly the paramyxovirus. And um, he also has coccidia and okay. he developed candida. Um, and so he's on- a, He had a rough time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but he's, he's doing so much better. I mean, when, when he was brought to the shelter, his head was upside down and, you know, he couldn't feed himself. He was too. Yeah. Um, and uh, PMV, so it's interesting. We, uh, we do see it, um, you know, we're, so our rescue, uh, we're lucky here in the Bay Area. We have a couple, not all of them, but a couple of wildlife uh, rescues that help the feral pigeons that do mm -hmm. the rehab and release if possible. And we direct all the all the wild pigeons that way. We're not looking to make free birds captive, you know. If, right, if, right. <laughs> if they can be rehabbed and released, um, and and also there's just not enough. We recreated this for domestic pigeons and doves because nobody was helping them. They can't be released, mm -hmm. and so they were right. just left outside to die or or were being shelter killed. Um, and. So the PMV, I, I mean, we definitely, uh, we see it. We don't see it very much. Um, I know if, if people would, we tell people, um, we actually have two PMV patients, right? This, at this time. And we tell people, if you look on the internet and you read about PMV and pigeons, what you're gonna see is breeders and hobbyists and sports people are saying, kill immediately. It's terribly contagious. It's, it's just, you know, and we have not found that to be true at all. We, mm -hmm. we undercrowd our birds. So my backyard aviary, for example, is 10 feet by 13 feet by seven feet high. And it's full uh, when there's about 20 pigeons in there. And if I was a breeder or a hobbyist, I would have 120 in there okay. Okay. and under those circumstances those people do have terrible contagion issues they their whole flocks are wiped out so their fear is is well founded 
um, they go through all kinds of uh, like bio safety measures. You know, they have a bleach bath at the door and they, they even immuni- uh, vaccinate and all this stuff. But if one of their birds gets sick, they all die because the crowding is so stressful for them. Um, where our birds, so we prioritize, we bring in, you know, the, the, the more jacked up they are, the more likely we're going to rescue them. And we don't have contagion issues at all. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, I said, that's really good. That's good news. Cause it does sound very scary. Uh, and for, for our parrot friends, it's a kind of a pigeon and dove specific virus that can be GI or neuro uh, or both and it's some recover quickly and are absolutely fine and then some are permanently disabled and, and many die so it's you never know what you're going to end up with um, but it's really scary you know when you see a uh, when you describe like a neuro bird and stuff you're like oh no <laughs> with their with their upside down head the torticollis yeah 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 Kind of sounds like the equivalent of exotic Newcastle disease, another another virus very common in California. Yeah, yeah, possibly related. I'm not sure if it's related, yeah. but yeah, similar. Yeah, I know that the same thing happens. The heads turn and hang upside down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so maybe maybe they are related. Yeah, but it could also it could also look like a bad head trauma too. You don't really know. Yeah. Wow. So okay. Plumacy only handles uh, domestic pigeons and doves, not feral pigeons that will be released to the back to the wild. What we do is, so when somebody finds a pigeon, a, a feral pigeon, we coach them and advise them. A lot of people think, oh, I got this little baby. I'm going to keep this little baby and raise it up. And um, Shelly, I think your birds really, really benefit from being multiples because when we have people like civilians raise up uh, a pigeon youngster in their home and then try to release them, it's a disaster. Yeah. They absolutely, they, absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're, so, they're so social, and like you know, parrots are the same. Like they're either with their friends or their human friends, and for, like a lot of birds are just extremely social, and that's why you're right. I like it when I have multiple babies at once because they help. They learn from each other and and stuff like that you're you're absolutely right so we coach and direct people to get rescued feral pigeons to pigeon friendly rescue wildlife rescue what we do though for example if like we've rescued ferals who have lost a wing right that bird is is never going to be releasable we know that there's no reason to route them to the wildlife rehab. So we'll take that bird in and they can have a fantastic life. Um, We have blind feral pigeons. So if a, if a feral pigeon is unreleasable, um, then we will, yeah, we'll, we'll help them find a home just like a domestic pigeon. Um, But if there's a chance that they can be healed and released, we have to have them take their chances on that because there's just not enough we're so outnumbered um there's probably like i mean when when we started this 15 years ago we were arguably the only rescue in the country dedicated to pigeons and doves and we're still one of only a couple and here in the bay area there's probably two or three hundred um pigeon breeders hobbyists racers uh, that are using these birds as if they're disposable. And that's what creates the need for us. Um, pit, you know, there's, there's people race thousands of pigeons. They breed them specifically for racing. They're, uh, they're, they're about 25, 30% bigger, heavier than feral pigeons. They're very muscular. Um, they band them. The bands are not to recover the lost birds. They're only to record the winners. And so pigeon racers breed and then take their pigeons hundreds of miles from home and release them in the thousands. 
they're either shipped or trucked. Like here in the Bay Area, they might, uh, all the Bay Area racers might ship or truck their birds down to San Diego for a race back or to Reno or further away. And many of those birds don't make it home. Like that it's, they fly their hearts out trying to get home, but lots and lots and lots of them don't. And most of them will die on the way. Like they're, the, the racers will tell you, oh, they're fine. They just join up with the ferals. But that's not true. If you look at feral pigeon flocks and you look for banded pigeons, you might see one out of 200 or 300. It's very, very rare. The feral pigeon, I mean, the, the domestic pigeons, the, the racing pigeons, they come to people asking for help. They, they come and they, they come to their doorstep. I mean, they're domestic, they're not wild. And so, yeah, so the need, like that's, that's what creates the need for this rescue. Um, I, was telling, I was telling Elizabeth earlier, a number of years ago, many years ago, I, I did have a bird like that come to my backyard and I saw the band and again, I, I didn't know anything about it. And I eventually found out that it was a racing pigeon, um, but I didn't know what the band was or if I should who I should contact, what should I do about it? And it, it was pretty skittish. It wouldn't come up to me, but it was hanging around feeding my backyard. Um, so now I feel really bad that I didn't make more of an effort to catch the bird. But so Elizabeth, if, if you see a bird like that, if you see a banded pigeon, and they don't necessarily look like our feral pigeons, right? Because I think the one I saw was multicolored. It didn't look like a standard city pigeon what should you do? Should you try to catch the bird? Will, is the bird going to be dying? Um, what, what should you do if that happens? That's a, a great question. And I'm going to expand it out because it really, um, it matters. What matters most is not the breed or type of pigeon. What matters is the situation. So if a pigeon is hanging around alone if they're not with a flock right that's a that's a yellow flag right there pigeons are not solitary um, they are flock birds and so if there's a you know if you come out and you see a pigeon that's just hanging around in your backyard by themselves that bird may well need help it might be a lost domestic pigeon it might be a released you know imprinted feral um, it could be a fancy, you know, whether it's a racing pigeon or a fancy breed for show or rollers, um, but it's, it's, it's asking for help. And um, they don't, you know, even though they're super smart, but they do not do well foraging. So they're usually starving and they're usually dehydrated. Um, the racing pigeons can be really in trouble because they can burn through half of their body weight in a race. And what that does is, I mean, you probably have all felt a terribly emaciated bird and where the keel is like a bread bone or like a bread knife just sticking out. They burn through all that breast muscle and eventually they're grounded in their effort to try and get home. And they can't, they can't fly because they, they don't have anything left. And so, um, yes, we have, like, we have great resources. Um, we have a, like I said, the Palomacy help group on Facebook is fantastic. That's, that's your first go to. If you have a question about a pigeon, like, is this a pigeon? Is this a dove? Does this bird need help? What's going on here? You take a picture and you post it up there and you'll get great advice. Um, it, we have 20 amazing volunteer moderators and they will help you suss out, is that a fledgling that you need to just leave alone so that it can go about its business and, and continue growing up and being fed by their parents? Or is that a domestic pigeon that has no business being outside alone? Um, and if you don't do that, um, we also have a lot of articles on our website, uh, what to do if you find a pigeon that needs help. Um, so there's a lot of information and yeah, they should be caught. So if you're in doubt, you know, involve, involve somebody who knows. 
something about pigeons. That's the quickest way to, because then we can really help um, kind of refine your response, right? We can tell you, well, you know, that's, because for example, a racing pigeon on occasion, they do hook up with a feral flock. So you might see a feral flock living, thriving, you know, drinking the, the, uh, the, the grass watering every morning, doing fine with a, with a racing pigeon in the middle of them with its band and everything. If that pigeon is keeping up and it's bonded and connected with that flock, that bird doesn't need help. That bird has made itself into a free life and is doing great. On the other hand, if the bird is just hanging out on your yard or on your doorstep or hiding under your car, then yeah, that bird needs help. And they come in all different colors and shapes. And if you see something really crazy, you know, you see the pigeons with the really fluffy feet or the big crests or they're snow white or they're, you know, all red or whatever. Those, you can be pretty sure those are domestic, but racing pigeons often look like the ferals. If to an untrained eye, they have the blue bar coloring or the feral, the, the blue check coloring. Um, so are homing pigeons and racing pigeons the same thing? All pigeons want to be home. All pigeons want to be home. Pigeons are such home bodies, which is one of the things that makes them such great pets. They are not restless. They are not um, high energy. We call them couch potatoes or masters of the leisure arts is what we call them. Um, and so all pigeons want to be home. This king pigeon, Willie, has zero ability to home. He's been bred to be big, white, and meaty for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations. So even though he wants to be home, he has no homing skills whatsoever. Um, all, all racing pigeons are homers, but not all homers are racing pigeons. It's like all race horses are horses, but not all horses are racing. You know what I mean? Like, um, but so some, all some people will release homing pigeons, but not actually race them for time. They'll just. Right. Right. Yeah. Do it for dove release. That's, that's the big business. And that's, that, that creates, you know, people don't realize it seems benign, like, oh, they just fly home. They're okay. Um, it, it, they're not okay. We rescue lots of um, lost dove release survivors. Um, and yeah, they all want to go home. They all try to get in to the extent like a king pigeon, they don't, they don't try to go anywhere. They just, they stand where they land until something chases them or spooks them. And then they'll, but they have no place to go and they know it. Um, and a lot of the little fancies, you know, the fantails and the, the capuchins and the Jacobins and all these fancy breeds, they have no homing skills whatsoever. They've been bred and bred and bred and bred to be show birds um, with these crazy features. It's like what they've done, like what humans have done to dogs, basically, you know, created all these different shapes and sizes. And it's no favor to the bird. The, the feral pigeons are the best. I mean, that's, that's the survival of the fittest DNA. They're the best designed pigeons. So tell us more about pigeon releases and, and, and how's that work? Do they, do they, what, homing pigeons in general, do they take them further and further away from home and do like test flights to train them to come home? Or do they just one day throw them in a box and drive them somewhere and, you know, basically sink or swim? You know, actually both happens, but I mean, Ideally, so professionals, they have all white homing pigeons and they breed them. And even though they're all white, their parents were all white, their grandparents were all white, their great grandparents were all white, still sometimes the babies hatch with color. And they don't want that. They don't want that in their bloodline. So some kill the babies that hatch with color, some give them away to you know, neighborhood kids or whatnot. 
Um, some actually release them. We, we rescue a suspiciously high number of small, all white homers, except for not white homers with black marks um, that were released in a park um, at an age they're too young to even be out of the nest. You know, it's like they, they, didn't, they didn't fall there. They, they were put there basically. Um, so right even before the, the releasing starts, it's, it's exploitive and dangerous for the birds. Then, um, yeah, they do, they do some training, you know, so they'll, uh, they'll let the adult birds fly out and the youngsters will follow. And most of them will get back, but not all of them. And that's okay. Um, they, don't, they don't want the failed birds. Um, pigeons are very prolific. Uh, a pair of pigeons can raise about eight or 10 babies a year, um, no problem. So, you know, I mean, if you lose some, that's okay. You're breeding them. We don't, Palomacy, we don't permit breeding. Um, that's the last thing the world needs is more dependent captive pigeons. Um, so, and yeah, and so most of them, you know, they're intended to get home. They're not being, they're, the, 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 the concept is for them to get home. What the professionals will tell you is that they expect to lose one to two to three birds at every release. The hawks get them, they get hit by cars, um, they just don't get it, they just don't get home. But Another harm that comes from this business is the notion that people have that white birds can be released and it's okay and it's celebratory. And so people literally will go to pet stores and buy little white ringneck doves. You know, those little tiny, they're barely, they're a little bit bigger than morning doves. They're completely inbred domestic little Streptopelia rosaria, they're, they, they'll buy them and they'll take them to an event and release them. And you might as well just kill them right there because they, they have no homey instinct whatsoever, no survival skills. I mean, they're just like such little sillies. It's not even funny. Um, or people go and they buy these king pigeons, the white king pigeons, right, the squab. And they think that we've rescued, I mean, people have taken them to funerals and then they dump them out. Like, cause the, you know, when they open it, they don't fly out. King pigeons are like, no, thank you. Like, I don't, I don't want to be out there. And so then they dump them out and then the birds just stand there because they have no place to fly. But, so even if you're not, um, so just the whole concept of dove release is um, is really harmful. To and it's terrific. I mean, I know I've talked to people about that, and they always just accuse you of being a, a party pooper. It's like right, right. You want to celebrate your your marriage by killing birds? That's that's your first act of being married to to murder birds. I mean, you think that's a good omen? But they don't. But the problem is, the, you know, these releasers tell them these wonderful stories, which are complete and utter lies. It's true. Every one of them will tell you, I've never lost a bird. I've never lost a bird, um, which is hilarious because we've got some of the rescues, you know, <laughs> in our, you know, so, um, okay, okay. But when, I mean, we've had professional, like people, we've had people who, who, come to us because they thought they wanted to do dove release and they tried it and uh, their hawk or their birds got, you know, attacked by hawks and everything. And so they got out of the business because they were like, oh, I don't want that. But they have been privy to the chats and the boards and the web listservs and everything with the professionals. And that's where they learn what really happens, you know, what really goes on. I think I think I'm going to go give Willie his his runaround time. Sure, sure. You guys get a good look at those big pink feeties. Oh, beautiful! Yeah. Such uh, a love. 
Yeah, he is. He's a sweetheart. And he's, um, this is, this is, a. Uh, he doesn't know what we're doing right here. So do you mind, excuse me for one second, I'll be right back. I'm just going to put him back. It's amazing what we don't know, right? Uh, that's why I, you know, I want to have the mean to talk all about pigeons and find out all about this stuff. Because I think a lot of people don't aren't aware of any of this. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah. You know, can I share a couple other things? Oh, um, funny, funny, please. When, when we do outreach events, people often come up to us and they say, oh, those are beautiful birds, not like those dirty... <laughs> you know, flying rats, those street birds. And we stop them right there. And we let them know like, these domestic birds are the man-made and less perfect, um, cre you know, uh, ancestors are not uh, uh, cousins of the, the feral pigeons. The feral pigeons are absolutely the strongest, the smartest, the fastest, um, they, they live on a razor's edge. It's amazing. I don't see how, I mean, anybody who's ever fed a baby pigeon marvels that in a parents living wild and free can feed their twins because they never stop. They are greedy, 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 greedy. Um, <laughs> yeah, they are just uh, like, like Shelley was saying, like, even when their crop I is agree with that full statement. and busted, <laughs> they never stop begging. But <laughs> So what we tell people, because most people are never even going to run into a domestic pigeon, like they can go their whole life without meeting a lost racing pigeon or somebody's dumped flock of fantails or whatever, but everybody's going to meet the feral pigeons. And what we tell people is one, they're absolutely 100% harmless. You are way more likely to get sick from your own dog or cat or a person in your home than you are pigeons are you're more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to be sickened by pigeons they get sick they have diseases yes but they are really really ineffective at conveying them and infecting humans so they're totally harmless and as you know they don't bite um their little soft bills are you know silly um they're completely harmless they never would attack you so we tell people um if a pigeon ever like you're out in the park and you're sitting on a bench or whatever and a, a pigeon lands on you or approaches you, that's, that pigeon is very likely socialized. And it might be, you know, from being fed at that bench all the time. But if a pigeon is really aggressive and lands on you, that's most likely somebody's lost or released raised up pigeon. So they're totally harmless. People say, oh, well, they're so stupid. They won't even get out of your way when you're on the sidewalk they're not they're brilliant pigeons are as smart as parrots and everybody i mean they're they're super super smart ravens and dolphins and they when they use them a lot for animal intelligence testing and they rate off the charts they're they self-recognize in mirrors they can recognize a human face in a photo which is crazy like why would that 2d thing even make any sense but they're super super intelligent so when they're not, yeah, I got to interrupt there. I don't know if people know that pigeons can actually read mammograms for cancer better than radiologists. When they're trained, so pigeons have exceptional vision. They have humans we see in three colors, red, blue, and green. And somehow that makes it all the rest of them. Pigeons see red, blue, green, infrared, no, not infrared, ultraviolet and yellow. And they can see millions more colors than we can. And their vision is exceptional. And yeah, so when they're taught what to look for in a mammogram, their uh, accuracy is as, and sometimes better than, than the radiologist because they have better vision. Um, they've been used to find people lost at sea. You know how in the ocean, when you're looking for that orange raft, I mean, it disappears. It turns into a speck of dust, right? It's like, 
And pigeons stay on task and will will see um, and spot that lost raft better than humans because. Um, but so what we tell people, yes, there's so pigeons are super intelligent and they're super emotional. They mate for life. They're very um, devoted. Both parents take care of the babies. Um, 100% the, the males sit on the eggs, they sit on the chicks, they feed them, they nest build, they do everything. Um, and if, if their mate gets sick or is failing and doesn't really make sense to stay with them anymore, they still do. They stay with them until they pass. And then they will remarry. It's not like they, but so they're very emotional, they're very intelligent. And then people say, oh, they're dirty. If you see a dirty pigeon, it's because they're trapped in a dirty environment. They love to bathe. They would never be dirty by choice. They're just like any bird. They're perfectionists about their feathers. They want every feather in place. Um, so we really tried to, and that's part of what the pigeon diplomacy. We want people to be nice and to be respectful and appreciative of the feral pigeons and not just take them for granted. In Australia, right, cockatoos, flocks of wild cockatoos. So here in America, you have a cockatoo on your shoulder, you're stopping traffic, right? That's a that's like, oh my God, it's an, it's incredible and they cost thousands of dollars. And you know, everybody in Australia, they're the nuisance birds. Right. They're the pests. They're treated as as callously as we treat pigeons because they're victims of their own success, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so feral pigeons, be, be advocates for them. And people, people, even really nice people will walk by a pigeon and be like, oh yeah, I don't wanna touch him. Like, I don't, I can't help, you know, just pick them up, put them, put them in a box, a bag, you know, take them on the bus, get them. That's another thing that's really important. If you if, see them, if they're injured or sick, not yeah. in general. If, if you can pick them up, they pretty much need picking up. But yeah, if you, that's another thing. People will see a, a hurt pigeon and then they'll go home and go online and say, there's a pigeon at such and such. No, that pigeon is probably some, everything eats pigeons, right? Ravens, crows, gulls, cats, dogs, coyotes, bobcats, rats everybody so if you see a, a a down pigeon don't wait pick it up take it home and then reach out for expert help and how do you care for a pigeon so let's say you find a pigeon bring it home what what do you do how do you what do you feed it what do you put it in so oh. and that's that's exactly so pigeons are really easy to care for but when you bring a pigeon home, you don't know the condition of that pigeon. Is that pigeon, if you're not, you know, if you don't have some background, you don't know. So we've seen people with young pigeons, um, not yet weaned pigeons, starving to death in their nice cage or crate with their nice food because the people don't realize the babies don't know how to self feed. Right. So it's important you got you want to get an expert looped in so they can say like, oh, you know, so this this bird should be self-feeding or this bird needs hand feeding or sometimes they come in, they're too weak and um, dehydrated. They need to be hydrated first right. and warmed and then they need to be um, sort of gently fed, you know, thin formula and get them back online, get their system back online. But if you have, like, if you were adopting from us to care for a pigeon, you'd have a, you'd either have them inside in a nice big cage, like a big, uh, those black wire dog crates work great for pigeons. Um, care, parrot cages aren't ideal unless they're super big because pigeons don't climb. They don't use all that vertical space. If you have a giant parrot cage, you put shelves so that they can hop and kind of use the, the space that way, but um, they're not gonna climb the bars. So width is the most important. A double flight makes a great um, 
pigeon cage. And you don't have to worry. One of the things that's different with pigeons, you don't have to worry about what the cage is made of because they're, they're not going to get, um, they're not going to chew through the bars. They're not going to break the bars and they're not going to get heavy metal poisoning. Um, if you want to keep your pigeons outside, cages aren't designed for outside. The cages are only meant to contain a bird. They're not meant to exclude hungry raccoons and hawks and rats and cats. And cats. So outside, you have to keep them in a predator and rodent-proof aviary. And that's not hard to do. We can totally, and we teach lots of people how to make them. It's, it's any handy person can make them. It's not a big deal. You can use galvanized wire. You can use, um, you know, two by fours. You don't need, like if you're building a parrot aviary, that's, that's a special, <laughs> you know, that you need, a, you need special materials and you really have to, um, uh, it's, it's much more expensive but you can have a very safe and wonderful pigeon aviary with basic materials that are, um, as long as it excludes rats and rodents and everything. So, and then they, they're vegans, they eat grains, they're grainivores, they eat, um, there's pigeon feed blends that are pre-made and lots of corn and peas and wheat. And oh, in fact, I don't know if you can see, I had this here for um, for Willie. So this one, I actually have some budgie seed mixed in because sometimes, you know, when a pigeon is special needs, sometimes they like the small seeds more or the big seeds more. We try to give them options because it doesn't matter exactly what they're eating at the moment, just that they're eating. And they just uh, they swallow right, and you need to give them grit so that it grinds up in their stomach. So they swallow everything whole. They could swallow a lima bean if they wanted to. People will look and they'll say, "Oh, that's too big. They couldn't swallow." No, that they they can't tear something. You know, if you give them a slice of pizza, they can't. You know, they're going to have a hard time like flipping that around and tearing it up. They but. Um, so they do swallow everything whole. So grit is actually, pigeons don't need grit to grind. They do need grit for minerals. Um, and, but it's not, uh, the pigeons can live their whole life without ever having grit, as long as they get the right minerals and vitamins. Um, and we've actually seen more harm from too much grit than we've ever seen from too little um, people. Cause that, that's a really super, it's funny. It's there are two things that everybody thinks they know about birds. One is if you touch a baby bird, the parents won't take them back, which is not true. It's completely not true. Um, and the other is they need grit. And we have people who will rescue a pigeon who's too weak to even eat. And the thing that they're worrying about is grit. And it's like, yeah, no, not, not an issue. We used to give parrots grit, and then we found out that that also a parrot shells everything in their beak. They don't need grit to grind anything up. And then a lot of vets start seeing parrots with grit impactions in them. Yep. Mouth. Yep. But you will, if you go to a pet store, you'll see them selling grit uh, and telling new bird owners to buy grit. And yep. you, you, you absolutely do not want to do that. So in it with a pigeon, is it just their muscular stomach then that grinds up? This it's amazing. Yeah, they have the they have their their crop and their gizzard. Their um, and yeah, and they they grind up this stuff as hard as rocks. I mean, dried. It's like popcorn. Like uh, you know, unpopped popcorn is part of what pigeons eat, and they grind it up no problem, and. Can they use a water bottle? So that's a great question. They they could. They're super. You've probably seen pictures of feral pigeons like drinking from a drip, like from a, yeah. you know what I mean? They're very, very clever. But pigeons are big drinkers and they love water. So we would all we always encourage big ceramic flat bottom dishes because they love to perch on the edge. They love to just plunge their head in there and drink a lot. 
Um, they also love to bathe. And um, so we, we like them to have um, water dishes. Which I'm sure have to be changed frequently then. You know, we, we change like once a day, like, you know, every 24 hours, even, uh, I mean, some people, you know, if, if they're, and their pigeons will, you know, birds will poop in their water um, and people just can't tolerate it. Like, oh my God, I have to change it. But that's a people thing. The, it, for the pigeons, it, it's not, it's really a non-issue. Um, they're fine. As long as they have fresh water, you know, every day. In fact, they don't think about, think about feral pigeons who are out there living on nothing but French fries and dirty gutter water. It, like how extraordinary are they? They can fly 60 miles an hour. You know, they live every part of the world over, you know, Chicago, New York, Berlin, Las Vegas, Phoenix, you know, it doesn't matter how hot or cold. It, they're incredible. I think, aren't they on uh, six continents, right? The only, yeah. Only place, yep. yeah the place you don't find a pigeon is Antarctica. Yep. Yep. That's the one thing I could count on no matter where I traveled in the world. Pigeons, mallard ducks, and house sparrows. There you go. Yeah. The, yeah. Like the, the triumvirate of, uh, of birds that have adapted to every type of, of situation. Yep. And that, now, uh, can a pigeon, uh, are, are they escape artists at all, the way parrots are? Um, not, not, not anywhere near like parrots are. Um, and, you know, parrots are so high energy and so busy, 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 right? Pigeons are chill. Pigeons like to nap. They like to lay in the sun. They like to soak in a bathtub. They like to watch TV. They like to. Uh, so, so I'm a pigeon. Yeah, yeah. No, they really. It's so easy to have a pet pigeon in your home. It, it's just incredibly easy. Um, and now, as far as escape, so pigeons. Uh, if you're not careful, so people like let's say you could have a really bonded pigeon, and this happens with parrots too. I'm sorry to say, bird that loves you desperately, right? rides around on your shoulder all day long and you go out front to talk to the mailman or get the newspaper or do whatever. And you know that bird would never leave you. That bird is desperately bonded to you, except they can get spooked, you know? Um, car backfire, a uh, 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 hawk passes by and off they go, they launch. And we, I mean, we tell people like, Clipped wings only inhibit flight indoors. Pigeons with clipped wings can get airborne and fly outside. The air current, you know, like you can, that's not a way to, to not lose your bird. It's so um, people sometimes make the mistake of putting their bird at risk like that um, or carrying, you know, people will sometimes carry like a, a cage from the top and the bottom falls out and they're, you know, they're on the way to the vet and they lose their birth that way. Um, what about king pigeons? Will, will they fly off or they're, <laughs> they fly like toaster yeah, ovens. Like they're kind of lumps. They're, I mean, they can't, what I always say is they can, they outfly us. So if they, if I put Willie outside and he got spooked, you know, he'd fly up to the fence or he'd fly up to the roof. He's got no place to go. He's like a big, you know, meal sign to all the predators. I mean, everybody knows. Um, but yeah, but he can certainly outfly me. He can. Okay. Yeah. 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 Even with clip wings outside, it's amazing. Like, and King Pigeons are, he weighs 600 grams. You know, they're chunky monkey. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but they, but they wouldn't escape from a cage. So, in other words, they're not like a cockatoo who's going to figure out how to un unlock the cage. <laughs> no, and they and they don't even want to. Yeah, they're not. Um, they're not near as uh, busy. Yeah, um, they pigeons. They need a significant other. If it's either you or another bird, um, you know they need a. They're they're not loners. They need a. a significant other 
Can um, they be okay with just a human or should yeah. they have a budget? If you're home, like if you're gone, you know, eight hours a day and that bird is home alone in a cage all day, that's no life. Um, you know, that's, that's a short term. If somebody finds a pigeon and they want to keep that bird and they want to help them, but they have to go to work, that's okay. That's a short term thing. That bird can be lonesome for a, you know, a few weeks, a couple of months while you figure it out and get them a companion. But no, they can't just, that's not a fair life for them. Diane? Thank you, thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Elizabeth. I was saying to Amy, when you stepped away, we certainly um, don't know what we don't know about, about these. Um, I'm on your, on your website and I see that the available birds, and you know, some are female, some are male. Willie says unknown. Can you tell the difference between a male and female pigeon? Thank you so much for going to our website. I love that. And you, you can't, um, there's a, there's only a couple of breeds that are um, gender dysmorphic or whatnot, whatever they call it. Um, yeah. Mo but most, and people will tell you, uh, breeders and hobbyists and racers, oh, I, I can look at that bird's head. That, that's a male. That's a female. Or feel their pubic bones. Oh, they're, they're close. That's male. That's 50 50, right? Okay. Um, if uh, sometimes, so when you're out in the world and you see a pigeon strutting around and dragging his tail and just like chatting up all the ladies. That's a male pigeon. That's an adult male. And, you know, you can trust that. That's true. But if you have a single female pigeon in, as a pet, she will start doing that to you. I call it going Sadie Hawkins because you're, you're not courting her. You're not figuring it out. So she will start doing that, but out in the flock, no, like that's, she, she won't do that. Um, Willie, I don't know. He's, he's not, they, pigeons are sexually mature um, at about four to six months. And that's when you start seeing the behaviors. Willie, because of his, I say he, like, I just pick a pronoun and go with it until I know otherwise. Um, so I'm, I say Willie is a he, but I have no clue. I'm 50-50 shot. Um, and because of his uh, condition, even though he's about the right age, he's four months old, so he could start showing some behaviors. He's, he's not well enough. You know what I mean? Um, he's with, when he's around other pigeons right now, he's just kind of mild manner like he doesn't he's not looking to fight he's not looking to flirt he's just you know he's just getting well he's recovering so if you have a domestic pigeon and you want to get them a buddy um does does it matter which sex you get since you won't even know which sex it is well they definitely know so um we do sometimes we've had a couple of, of male male couples and they are very devoted and very bonded and we give them fake eggs to sit on and you know their love is real like there's nothing but it's not as common more often two females if they don't have any options the two females will will bond and usually become married um two male pigeons might get married or they might stay persistent rivals for years um Male and female, they pretty much, you know, they, they, they're smart. They take one look, they're like, wow, you are the best looking pigeon here. And boom, they marry. And we help people, we call it pea harmony. We help coach people. Like you can't just bring home a strange pigeon and put it in your pigeon's cage and be like, okay, no, that's, that's like a stranger moving into your bedroom. Like no way. So um, we can help people and you can get a DNA test, you know, you can do the, pull the feathers and send it away and get a, a gender test that way. Um, or sometimes we'll have people bring their single pigeon 
to hang out in a flock of, of fosters and kind of, you get to, you can kind of see there because then they're like, oh, you know, they start flirting and, um, but yeah, we, if you get connected with somebody, uh, you know, a good, a pigeon rescuer, not a pigeon breeder, not a pigeon seller, I tell you, they're not trustworthy. I'm, I'm, you wouldn't believe the, the cleanup that we have to do because people, oh yeah, we bought these and they're both the male and a female and, but they fight all the time. No, they're two males. Some genius looked at the head and said, oh, that's a male head. Ooh. And, and so now we've got to help them figure that out. You know what I mean? So ideally it would be best if your pigeon had a buddy and it would be best if they were the opposite sex. It's just hard to figure out ahead of time. So like, let's say you have a rescue pigeon and your local animal shelter gets one in you go, I want to adopt it, but reasonably, you're probably not going to know ahead of time. There's a couple, of, so behaviors, sometimes what we would do, uh, we've done a few P Harmony parties at like, sometimes there's rescues where, you know, we, there was 23 king pigeons dumped in Golden Gate Park and they were all at San Francisco Animal Care and Control. And we brought them all into a get acquainted room and you can see like, you know, some, you know, so they sort themselves out if they're old enough. If they're not yet mature, then they don't. They're just, they're youngsters and everybody flirts. You know, all the males are after the kids, no matter what their gender is. Um, but there are ways. So uh, we will like, you have a nice big mirror. Pigeons love a big mirror, not a little budgie mirror but like a full size, we get like in an aviary, we get a full size closet back door kind of mirror and turn it the long way. Yeah. And males, they love to show off. They, they dance and strut and where the females will just kind of like, they just lay with their, their, their reflection. They kind of just keep company. Um, but the males will strut and coo and really show up. Um, so and you can same do, as with parrots. Yeah. <laughs> You can play videos um, for your, like pigeons are great with iPads and YouTube and videos. Like you can play uh, a, a male according, a video according male pigeon. And your pigeon may well like roar to life and be like, oh no, I'm the man, you know? And they start getting all, um, and then it's like, okay, so I guess I have a dude um, or, you know, she lays an egg. Pigeons lay eggs if they feel married. They don't just lay them automatically. Um, ah, okay, that's but good. If if they're married, so they could be married to another a male pigeon. They could be married to a female pigeon. They could be married to you, and they'll lay eggs, two eggs, about once a month. And for us, we we replace them with fake eggs uh because no hatching we the last thing we want is any breeding and like parrots you you want non-breeding behavior right you keep them quiescent you shorten the daylight and no hidey places and nothing nesty and you know certain diet and you really don't touch them here and there right pigeons none of that matters they will they will lay eggs through implants through shots um, it's, it's almost impossible like to, to keep a female pigeon from laying eggs, you have to have her almost, I mean, so deprived that it, it's not fair. You know what I mean? Like you, you, even if you take away all the nesty stuff, um, no matter what you do, they will lay eggs. So you have to, I assume you have to make sure the female gets enough calcium as you mentioned. Definitely. definitely. And safe light of safe unfiltered by glass light you know safe access to natural light unfiltered by glass because that helps them metabolize it's really really important do they ever have a problem with getting egg bound the way that parrots do they do they do egg laying is complicated and that's that's sort of the achilles heel um we always have more bachelors than single females because reproductive disease. Um, what we, our, our approach to that 
is to, because like I said, we've tried every, I mean, I, I, we wish we could stop them from laying eggs. That would be, you know, there's, we don't, um, and there's no joy in taking their real eggs away and replacing them with fakes. I mean, we don't like that either, but we've not found any way to prevent them from laying. So what we do is try to give them the best possible nutrition and lighting and support so that the eggs they do lay are healthy and that reduces the likelihood of complications. Do they tend to always be fertile? I mean, so if you have a married pair that's opposite sex, they will be mating all the time. Right? <laughs> like some that, and that sometimes sneaks up on people. Like right now I have a, a pair of foster pigeons. Kenny has um, a frozen wing. And so he's the male. And so he's awkward. Like he, he can't hop and mount and like do all the stuff like, he should be able to. And his mate is actually a PMB survivor who's a little narrow. She's, she's fine. She takes care of her business and, you know, but she's a little special too. And so their, their first few sets of eggs weren't fertile. Um, but I, I knew better, like, I'm not going to assume that they'll never, and, and this last, last set, you know, they figured it out. They, they made it, <laughs> they, they, they achieved a uh, launch. So. Yeah. I guess it's best to just always assume they might be. Yes. Hurt. Yeah. So yeah. you don't have any whoopsies. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about the noise level now? I'm, I mean, I know they say pigeons are pretty quiet, but I've also known people who could not stand the constant cooing, even though it wasn't very loud. It was sort of, you know, it was just like this little, this torture of the constant right. Right. We hear that more with doves, like male doves coo a lot. They are very vocal and they coo a lot and they're slightly louder, even though they're much smaller, like doves are about 170 grams. Um, they're a little louder than pigeons. Um, female pigeons are very quiet. They hardly coo at all. I mean, they will, you know, they, they have some vocalizations, but it's, it's the males that do um, the moaning and groaning, you know, every week or not every month, they want to go find a new nesty place. And they get in there like under the couch or, you know, in, in this corner, or that corner, and they moan and groan and call and coo. And they're showing the what a great nest place it is with their acoustics. You know, it's clever. And then the female will come and she's like, yeah, you know, that's all right. And then he'll go find another place. And, you know, so they do that for a week and then they choose and lay eggs. Um, but it's, it's no comparison to parrots because it is, it, it is low. And um, yeah, I a lot of us. The constantness of it that people, I've heard people say that, they'll do that 24 hours a day. Is that true? No, um, it's it, so, I mean, I think about people like living in the city and they have pigeons, you know, living in the, the rafters or on the ledges of their building or whatnot. And so they're kind of living in a flock. And so, you know, somebody might always be cooing. Not everybody is always cooing, but somebody, um, and they do sometimes they will, they, I mean, they sleep in the middle at, at night, you know, but sometimes they will coo. You hear them cooing in the, at late night. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't know if you can hear like, so I can hear my, I have a foster aviary and I have my aviary in the backyard and um, I can hear like, I mean, I don't know if you guys have caught any of it, but there was some cooing earlier nobody's cooling right now like it's quiet okay yeah i mean there are people that complain barely about cockatiel and budgie noise it's like yeah. seriously right go go it's get a is the is the car alarms like I, you know like i i'll listen to pigeons all day and night but please stop the car alarms my goodness I mean, I have wild morning doves here and they breed here and they're, yeah. they're here around. So I, I'm used to cooing all the time anyhow. And morning doves, and that's a really sweet, soft, you know, they're, 
That's a mourning doves aren't quite as uh, it's the domestic ring neck doves that are so, you know. <laughs> and now their bite doesn't doesn't even hurt, right? Because it's just like a this. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. Um, <laughs> I know we, we had somebody who was a club member briefly a while back and she was looking into getting a parrot and then one of our club members wanted to rehome her pigeon or dove and uh, that ended up being exactly what she wanted. She yeah. was afraid of pigeon yeah. bites. Yeah. She was afraid, yeah. I mean, of parrot bites and right. parrot noise and yeah. the pigeon was perfect for her. It's, it's true. Like, if you're going to take good care of a parrot, you have to really devote yourself. Like, that is, that is not easy. They, they have needs, and, and you have to be very dedicated to meeting those needs and keeping them safe and keeping them active and keeping them happy. Pigeons are so much easier. They are, like, you can, you can be a great pigeon parent where what you're providing would be like a terrible parent parent you know what I mean like their needs are just very very different and it's interesting I mean they're very emotional and smart but they're they're just lazy they're they're not high energy they're not busy um I used to have yeah they're probably good for an apartment right because there's not a lot of noise very very yeah and they're and they're couch potatoes people will say um oh it's terrible you should never keep them caged or you know or keep them in these aviaries let them go free I would be the first person I would love I mean all birds should be free from my perspective I I would love to see all pigeons wild and free but these domestic birds that humans have created there is no domestic sky they have to have a home if they're to survive they can't it's not fair to put them out there they don't make it um and it's actually really easy. Pair, pigeons care about home and mate. That's, they, they, want, they, they, they want a home and they want to be loved. And if they have those things, they're really, really easy. They like to sit in the sun, like some good food, but they don't even need, you know how with parrots, you're, gonna, you're doing chops and you're wanting, you know, birdie bread and you want to give them all, you know, pigeons, they do fine on a, on a basic land and you can provide some greens and, um, but they don't, their nutritional, their, their uh, sort of economy of, of nutrition is in extraordinary. Now, oh, what about toys? Because you know, I've talked about toys. They do like toys, right? Well, so some of the toys that we recommend for example, is like a plushie that hangs like a, like a punching bag. Um, and they'll punch it, peck it, wing slap it, and it will come right back at them. And that's a good, so if you have like a, uh, if you only have one pigeon or you have a pair of pigeons in the house, they don't have the normal social energy opportunities, you know, to burn that social energy that they would in a flock. So we do create um, situations for them to like be feisty and to, to fight with things. Um, some pigeons will, will, will uh, fetch, you know, you throw a crumbled piece of paper and they'll go get it. Um, some pigeons will, you know, sort of noodle around with a bell a little bit. We have people who, you know, those, those puzzle feeders We've got people who are doing that with their pigeons now. They go through that or those foraging mats, you know, that like they're like all those felt. Mm -hmm. They and they, you know, so, but they don't chew. They don't chew. So, you know, parrots have to chew. So the toys, a pigeon toy will last forever. <laughs> you don't have to replace them you know because they they don't chew they don't chew your wood they don't chew your cords um so there's a whole nother that's a whole nother level of ease you know now uh i would i would guess they probably sensitive to teflon and things like that though yes. right yep yeah. 
Yep. yep. That, that stuff you still have to do. Yep. 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 The same uh, respiratory, you know, they're, they have very sensitive respiratory systems. Okay. Okay. But at least you don't have to worry about them chewing up the furniture and things like that. Right. Or eating the lead paint. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like sticking their, they won't, they don't stick their faces in light sockets either. You know, they're not electrical sockets. They're not near as mischievous. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they do sound like a perfect pet for people. Um, I actually kind of want to circle back a little bit. You know, what's a pigeon? What's a dove? Like, there are a lot of wild doves in the United States, but all, all the doves you see, all the wild doves you see are actually protected by federal law. So it would be illegal to bring those home. It would, unless you're federally permitted. Yeah. Uh, it would be illegal to rehab them without federal permits. It would be illegal to keep them as pets. Uh, they have to be released. If they're non-releasable, then you would need an educational per permit to keep them. That that sort of thing. So um, we, you know, we tend to think of pigeons as the feral pigeons, and then we've got the king pigeons, the homing pigeons, the racing pigeons, those exotic weird pigeons, um, and then the the at least in the United States and doves as as the wild federally protected birds, but are there domesticated doves? And what, what's the difference between a dove and a pigeon? You know, there when are, you so, so the, the doves that we rescue are either ring neck doves, it's Streptopelia rosario, I, pardon my Latin, it's, but they're, they're a different species. They're not like pigeons are Columba Livia, that's their species. And this, the ringneck doves are that um, Streptopelia rosario. They're, um, they're introduced into the United States, right? Well, they're domestic. So well, they also are- Also like pet store birds. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, or like turtle doves also. I think they, they, they raise them in the United States or occasionally you get one. Um, I think those are more European though. Yeah, so I mean, I've- I, to me, like I, I, like I hear so turtle, I've heard every kind of dove has been like at some point called a turtle dove. Um, we, there's Eurasian collared doves. They're non-native, but they're, uh, they're thriving all over. And so um, here in the Bay Area, uh, we try to get them to rehab and release. But if not, it's, it's legal to have them. They're not protected. And pigeons have no, now band-tailed pigeons, that's the native to America. Like, I don't know, we have them in, out here in the West. I don't know if you guys have them in the East, but band-tailed pigeons have yellow feet and beaks. They look like, they, they look pretty much like a pigeon. They're a little, their colors are a little deeper, a little richer. Like if you think of a, a morning dove, but big. Um, but they have yellow feet, yellow beaks, and that is a protected band-tailed pigeon. That's a native bird. That's a native bird. Okay. They're the closest living uh, descendant from passenger pigeons, you know, that were wiped out. Um, we don't, you know, we get them to rehab. They're, they're a protected species. They're not, um, they, they're, and they don't hang around in the city. They're wild birds. They, they live in the fields and the you know, the, the forests and they're not, they're not domestic. They're not feral. They're wild. Um, but pigeons, so the feral pigeon, that's Columba Livia. And all of these other, the, the racing pigeons, the homing pigeons, king pigeons, and all the fancy breeders, the breeds, those are all uh, domestic selectively inbred cousins of those feral pigeons. They're all in the same. Now, dodos, they were pigeons. Right. And there's uh, the there's some very tropical, there's the Nicobar pigeon, right? That has the fantastic, you know, like, oh, the Nicobar is the one that has like the emerald green long yeah, colors. They're yeah. definitely. And then there's the crown Victoria pigeon, right? They're big and they have like that crazy, yeah. you know, so those are wild. Those are different species of wild pigeons, but all the domestic ones, all these ones that humans use 
are all selectively inbred from the, the, the Columba Livia. That's, that's the descendant, that's the ancestor of all of these domestics. So you get those and you get the ring neck doves. Yes, yeah, yeah. And if you find a wild one that is injured or abandoned, whatever, generally nobody's gonna be looking for it, right? Or is it possible somebody's lost a pet and they actually want the bird back? So that's a great question. People who want their birds back, look for them. They put on Craigslist, they put on Nextdoor, they, they post on Parrot 911. You know, they, they do something to, uh, the racers and the breeders and the, they don't look for their birds. They don't want them. And if you, if you track them down, so those, those bands are cryptic. Right. <laughs> they're coded and they're only the only purpose of them is to record winners they don't want losers in fact at the end of the season they will either kill or sell to dog hunting dog trainers or to pigeon shooters i mean there's a so they're not looking for the 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 birds that don't win they only want the winners um they will tell you if you trace a band of a racing pigeon and you do reach through the club secretary and everything, and you do reach an owner, what they will tell you is, oh, thanks, that's great. Yeah, just put out some food and water for him. In a couple of days, he'll come home. And he, that's not true. he might try. If, if he gets recovered enough, he might try, but that's no guarantee whatsoever that that bird is going to get home. That's just their way. They tell, and, and, you know, people are like, oh, okay, you know, and that's good. And they're happy. Like, oh, he went home. Yeah, no, we, uh, that's, that's uh, BS. So people who use a uh, pigeon, they will post to uh, paratalert.com and 911 paratalert. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And sometimes like we've created bands and it says pigeonrescue.org. So if you put our band on your pigeon and they're found, in fact, we just, we just reunited in Canada. Uh, a woman had, she had a little special needs pigeon. Mm -hmm. He had, he was missing half of his top beak. He couldn't, couldn't even self feed little. Um, she had our band on him. He got lost uh a nice bar pizza place owner he was hanging around got noticed and saw pigeonrescue.org and contacted us and we were able to get that bird home wonderful. um wonderful and people do like some people will get a band that says their phone number or they'll say pet and they'll put their phone number um or even if they're not banded they'll look for them they put flyers out that you know like if, so when I first started this, I thought if I find a racing pigeon, I should try and return it. No, I absolutely, that would be like returning a, a, a rescued pit bull to dog fighters. There's nothing, they don't want them. They don't deserve them. And you know, what I'd say, people say, well, like you can't just keep my bird. I'm like, well, you know what? Tell that to the hawk that, that ate your bird. Tell that to the raccoon that tore your bird apart. Tell that to the coyote that ate your bird. You know, like, like, hey, when the hawks start contacting the racers to check and see if they can eat that, that lost racer, that's when I'll start. Well, they don't want him back anyhow. I mean, I learned the same thing with the, that bird that came, that had this big blue band. I was working hard to try to fit, yeah. find its owner and... Yeah. Uh, and now, you know, on our wild bird list that we have here in Connecticut, every once in a while someone pops up and says, you know, I found a pigeon as a band, who do I contact? And, you know, myself and other people just jump on and say, no one wants the bird. Yeah. People don't, people don't know this. Pigeonrescue.org is the best resource I can give you because we will help. Um, we coach and counsel people. Sometimes people are like, well, I don't want this pigeon. I can't keep it. It's like, okay, that's cool keep them for a few days and we'll help network you and put you in touch with somebody in your area that can maybe foster or rescue that bird. You know, um, 
you've got it. You've got a network over the whole country, right? So if if I yes. contact you from yes. and say I found this pigeon, you know, I can keep it for a few days, a few yep. weeks, but, but I have to find it a home. You can help me out here. Absolutely, absolutely. We don't. So if if you lived here in the Bay Area and you had a pigeon that you had to surrender or that you couldn't keep, we might take that bird into our foster care and it would become a Paloma C responsibility. We right. only do that in the Bay Area. Right. But, so we're not gonna just take them off your hands like that, but we do have a network, not only all over the country, but all over the world. And we will help connect you with, okay. um, and we help, I mean, we've got people who are looking to adopt and we connect them and we have people who are just fostering um, everybody's full. Anybody that rescues pigeons is full. The 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 need is outrageous. Um, for every for every one domestic pigeon that gets rescued, there's probably a thousand that were dis treated as if they were disposable. I mean, it's what's our, the life, what's the lifespan of a pigeon? In the wild, you know, if they live seven years, that's a good, long, successful reign. Um, in your home, protected, they can live 10 to 20 years. Okay. We rescued a pigeon that was 22, and he lived to be 28. How did you, oh, how did they, you know it was 22? We actually um, were able to link him back to his person. So that's why we even knew his name. Um, and sometimes pigeons do one, one bit of information they do have on their bands. Um, like you'll see, uh, you know, the numbers are running along the band, but then you'll see usually a two digit number that's running up and down and it might be 18 or it might be 21 or it might be 20 or it might be 2000. We have another pigeon, um, his name is Wisdom. He, he was hatched in, in 2000, he's 22 years old. Um, so you can uh, sometimes get an age from the bands. Other than that, I would assume if you just found, you know, king pigeon or fer a non leasable feral pigeon that it would be, well, this, like with parrots, who you'd be unable to, to determine the age unless they were either very, very young or very, very old. Pretty much, there's some uh, some traits like racing pigeons. Their their sear uh, keeps getting gnarlier and gnarlier and grow and like so. That's something that when we see a raced pigeon, a racing survivor, and then we can tell like that's you know that bird is at least six, seven, eight, maybe more. Mm -hmm. But there are other breeds of pigeons. Um, like carrier pigeons that are bred to have this huge, it looks like a big walnut on their face. Like it, so it, you, if you looked at that, you would think, oh my God, that bird must be 30 years old. No, it's a breed feature. So, you know, you can't always tell. Are there still carrier pigeons? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> well, so people do still use pigeons to deliver messages. Um, carrier pigeon is a, is a, actually a breed there. Um, it's like, uh, yeah, there's all, but so I'm glad you mentioned that Amy though, that the thing about carrier pigeons or delivering, all those pigeons are doing is flying home. So if I wanted to send a message to you, I'd have to have your pigeons. And I'd have to have a couple of them and I'd put a message, a duplicate message, and then I'd release them and they would fly their hearts out trying to get home. They're not delivering anything. All they care about is home. And they have, pigeons have a crazy ability to find, so these racing pigeons, I mean, and they've done lots of studies. They've raised hatched racing pigeons in containers, like no natural light, no access to natural uh, wind or anything, like in a totally enclosed artificial. And mm -hmm. they have taken them hundreds of miles 
from home, still enclosed, still with no clues, no cues whatsoever, and released them. Mm -hmm. And they all try to get home, and some of them do. And they, people have no, it's, part of it is polarized light, part of it is infrasound, they hear, part of it is landmarks, but if they've never seen any of that, like how, you know, it's incredible, like the feats that, um, that homing pigeons, um, and it's, they're not even migratory, like why, why do they have such a good ability to get home? And that, don't they have magnetic particles in their brain too? They do. And yeah. so if you, like, if somebody wants to get rid of feral pigeons, let's say you've got a business or a home and you're like, oh, I don't want this, you know, these birds are pooping on the sidewalk. You, it's easy to trap pigeons. There's nothing easier than to catch pigeons. You have a one-way trap with food in it and they go in and then the others go in and like, it's, it couldn't be easier. Like trapping pigeons is like nothing. And it's big business. If you get on the phone and you want, they'll charge you hundreds of dollars to come and catch your pigeons, which couldn't be easier. Um, and you took those pigeons away. Like you're a nice person. You don't want to kill them. You don't want to sell them to hunting dog trainers. You just want them to live somewhere else. So you drive them 60 miles away to a nice place where, you know, this is a good place. And you let them go. They are going to try and home. And some of them will make it. You know, like not all of them, it's not a, but they will try and come home. And even if you, what the, what the pest control places do is they kill them or they sell them to be used. Um, but if you don't exclude the, the new birds from the resources, new pigeons will just move in. It's, it's the resources and the access, like something is there that's good for the birds. And so unless you, you know, block that or stop the feeding if if somebody if you have a house or a there's a corner in your neighborhood or whatever and there's a lot of pigeons that hang out there they're being fed they, that's that's it's very easy to get your own flock of feral pigeons you just come out there and feed them and they will they'll follow your car i mean they're smart uh, and then what about those exhibition pigeons, all those weird pigeons that have been bred to have defects, like, like those horrible, horrible rolling pigeons yep. that are bred to have epileptic fits in the air. Yep. Uh, they're just used for exhibition. Do, do those go rogue sometimes too? And you find they, them and do they, they want them back or? That, so yeah, roller pigeons are selectively inbred, just like you said, for a defect that results in petty mall seizures. It's, it's triggered by barometric pressure. So it's uh, as barometric pressure changes when they're flying, it'll trigger these seizures. And usually they're just a couple and then they come out of it and, and they do fly those for competition. Um, the, the point of it being that your whole flock uh, seizes <laughs> in, in, you know, synchronicity, like they, uh, but those birds do okay. get lost. They're not good homers. They're small. Um, the people who breed rollers and tumblers, they hate raptors. Oh my goodness. They are, they're raptor killers. They hate hawks because the raptors, as they say, eat their birds like popcorn. Um, another thing that they do is they breed for, or they call it rolling deep. So they like the thrill of a tumbling pigeon that comes way low, rolling deep before it comes out of the seizure and recovers. Like those blue angels that fly really close yeah. to the ground, and but then everyone's once in a while, one of them can't pull up and they crash and die. Exactly. And they breathe for that. They like it. That's like a macho, cool, like, ooh, your birds roll deep. Um, and many of them, like, they, yeah, I mean, they they don't get out. Like, they, you know, their safety record is much worse than the, the, the Blue Angels. They they get hurt all the time and killed. Here's another thing. And this is this is one of the most depraved things 
I, I, people have ever done, I think. Humans have bred what are called parlor rollers. And these pigeons have been bred to the point where, you know how if you toss a bird, they open their wings to land, right? They, you know, they break their fall, they open. Parlor rollers, when they extend their own wings, it triggers a somersaulting seizure. And they have competitions at, you, you know, at fairs and across the lawn. And I, I don't, I can't, I think the, you know, like one of the records is, I don't know, 60 yards or something, but it's, it's a thing. So these birds, you can see it online, like Google parlor rollers, and you'll see them, they, they can't even open their own wings without triggering a seizure. Um, and I can't even imagine like deliberately creating that, like doing that and thinking it's cool and it's fun. And they'll tell you, if you ask them about it, they'll say, oh, our, my birds love it. My birds are great. They eat better than your kids, blah, 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 blah. They're very, you know, it's. You know. Well, then we have things like the state of Pennsylvania with their annual pigeon shoot, which still hasn't been outlawed, which I find astonishing. Them, You know, they, they capture all these pigeons and then release them to be shot just for sport, not even for food or anything else. Like, like it's a sport to murder defenseless animals. Yep, yep. It's unbelievable. And it's legal. There's the yeah. people- um, These are not protected animals. Yeah. And for some reason it doesn't fall under animal cruelty statutes that, that I don't understand. I don't understand it. I mean, shark uh, showing animals, respect and kindness. That's the name of the shark. They're a great rescue. I mean, they're fighting rodeos and horse racing and pigeon shoots and dog fighting and cock fighting. They're amazing. And they, they have done more to fight those fights than anybody. Um, but yeah, like, and it's, I mean, how is pigeon racing legal? So if you Google- How is dog racing legal? If you Google pigeon racing and you, what you'll see is a big, huge truck, you know, like 40 feet long, however the long those semis are. And the whole thing is compartments, all both sides. And they're, they're on levers and they pull them and they're deep. They go, you know, there's, so there might be 20 or 30 pigeons in one of those compartments. And when it's time for the race, 600 miles from home, they'll pull the levers, all the things fly open or, you know, the, and the birds take off. And, you know, when one pigeon flies, like they're all, they, and they're off. And these are domestic birds. They're not wild. So it'd be like, if you took 2000 bloodhounds and let them all go, you know, in, in 300 miles from home, because they have their nose and they can find their way home. And the other, I mean, and, and then humans are killing pigeons, right? They're considered a nuisance animal. They're considered a pest. Shelters have no uh, responsibility for caring for them. They can choose to just kill them. It's a nuisance animal. They don't have to, some shelters are doing much, much better and they're caring for them now and getting them placed into homes. Um, but the idea that we're killing with no protections whatsoever, the ferals, at the same time that people are releasing hundreds of thousands. This is not a, it's, it, there's a couple million racing pigeons used every year wow. around the world. Like it's not a, you know, it's not 50 here and 50 there. It's a lot of birds. And, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So how is that? I don't know. I don't know how they get away. With, and I would love it we, I mean, one thing we don't have is a, is an advocacy or a policy branch. You know what I mean? Like we're so busy rescuing and band-aiding um, and, and uh, uh, we just haven't gotten the resources yet, but someday we're going to have someone to help us get dove releases outlawed, pigeon right. releases. I mean, the, the pigeon racing outlawed, it's, it's terrible. 
it's hard when people have no respect for birds. You know, this dogs and cats get the lion's share of attention in general, at least in the pet industry. And even then they undergo horrific things as well. But, you know, birds are, you know, I'm sure everyone has been told at some point or another when their bird has died, what's the big deal? Just go get another one. Like it's a disposable razor or something. It's hard when people don't appreciate and understand birds, which is why our outreaches are so important in general. Absolutely. You know, there are a number of people who haven't said anything. Does does anybody want to ask Elizabeth any questions about pigeons and you know? You know, just unmute yourself if you'd like to say something or ask something. You know me, I'll I'll keep talking as well. Um, with the domestic pigeons, they can be kept in aviaries outdoors in maybe weather that we wouldn't put our parrots outside in. Absolutely. They are so hardy. And yes, we have um, rescue partners and adopters all over the country, upstate New York, Chicago, um, Minnesota with aviaries. And yeah, there, there needs to be some shelter, you know, it can't. Um, and there needs to be a portion of the aviary that stays dry and they need water that stays liquid. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to have fog, but yeah, no, they do fine. In fact, pigeons are more uh, cold tolerant than they are heat tolerant. They can tolerate heat, Florida, Las Vegas, Phoenix, wherever, but they, they just, they don't do anything. Like they're just, they really kind of slow down even more, but cold weather, they're absolutely fine. And they love rain. Um, yeah, no, they thrive in outside aviaries. They, that's a great life. Um, wow. and it's, it's a really easy way to help because wherever you are, believe me, there are some domestic unreleasable pigeons who need a home. And to have a backyard aviary, it's not a hard thing. And you can say four or six or 12, have a nice flock. And it becomes, people get those webcams, like a nest cam. You can enjoy them from indoors, from your desk. You can, um, we see people like a lot of times it's kids who fall in love with pigeons at, and then their parents like, okay, okay. And they build an aviary for them. They adopt from us. And then, you know, we go and we visit and we help them along. And about the second or third time I get there, they have all this new outdoor furniture. The aviary has become a destination. It's <laughs> lovely to sit there and to watch them. They're courting and they're strutting and they're preening and they're happy. And it's a very restful. And what, what I love about it is you're not making a, a, a bird captive. These birds need homes. They have to have a home. Um, you're doing, you're not, you're not exploiting them. You're not, uh, you know, you're not harming them, you're helping them. And they're easy. I mean, you could take care of a flock of pigeons in an aviary. It's about a half an hour a day. You know, it's not a hard thing. I mean, you do some poop scraping, fresh water, fresh food, check for eggs, replace real eggs with fake. And we will hold your hand the whole way. Like you don't, if you have a friend who's like, yeah, you know, I'd be kind of interested, but I wouldn't even know where to start. Don't worry, we've got that. And you can mix and match these pigeons. So you could have a roller and a king and a, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't mix pigeons and doves because okay. doves are way smaller, 170 grams versus 300 for a pigeon or 400, 500, 600, 700. Um, and pig doves start stuff. Doves are like, they, are, they, they start things. And the pigeons are very yeah. peaceful and they're calm and they tolerate it for a long time. And then all of a sudden one, like leave me the heck alone. And that can be catastrophic for the smaller dove, right? Are so all these pigeons, the same species and just different breeds? Yes, exactly. Like Not the doves, dogs. yeah. But so all- They can all mate with each other they too. They can, they absolutely can. And they do great. And we've had, um, in fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reply to your email um, with some of my favorite photos. Oh, good. And like, 
there's one of a, a king pigeon who he's huge. He's like this. And he's married to a Homer, a little dove release Homer, who's like, and it looks like a baby. Like if you didn't know what you were looking at, you'd think like, oh, well, that's his baby. No, that was a married couple. And that was Milkshake Mike and Pipsy. And I was worried because he was so huge. He was the sweetest, gentlest husband. He never gave her, like he was, he was, um, I've had big, king pigeon lady who was single which is like that's you know and she had all these bachelors courting her who's she gonna pick she had another king pigeon that looked just like her big magnificent white you know really stunning glamorous guy then there was another uh a kind of a fancy pigeon with a lot of feathers and a crest and you know kind of and then there was a little a helmet pigeon little tiny guy black and white like sharp Looked like he was wearing a helmet, right? There's this sharp coloration. She picked him. And so we have these pictures of big giant June bug with her little guy, but that's who, you know, so yeah, you can, and pit, pigeons are very peaceful. They're very tolerant. Um, they, their fights usually, they settle in themselves. They, they, they're self-limiting. Um, people often ask, can you keep them with chickens? It's the same thing. You can keep them next door to chickens, but you can't, chickens are a very different energy. They're, you know, they, and the, if they can get along almost all the time and then one conflict can be fatal to the pigeon. But pigeons will never actually harm another pigeon then, right? Rare, it's very rare. Um, it's, for example, you, if you have a pigeon who's, who's sick or weak, in an aviary they could they can have a long they can have a wide range like we can have like non-flighted pigeons we even have some blind pigeons that live in flocks like they can have a real tolerance a real wide range of abilities but they have to kind of stick up for themselves they have to kind of you know even if they're little doesn't matter if somebody you know pick they have to like and that that really manages it but if a pigeon gets too down or sick or weak or is too um, timid, that bird can get hurt. And that's when you need to do some, you know, like whether whatever it might be, it might be segregating. It might um, if, if, the, if the pigeon is sick, um, they need to be segregated for protection until they're recovered and strong. Another thing you can't do, for example, if you've got your nice flock of rescue pigeons in your aviary, and you find a little youngster, a feral youngster, you can't just bring that bird home and put it in the aviary. Um, Non-parental adults will injure and sometimes kill a juvenile. Wow. Um, at the same time, we will foster it sometimes. And Shell, are you still there? Yeah, you're still there. Uh, yes, I'm here, I'm here. Um, so for example, sometimes, here in the Bay Area, we'll get little hatchlings, right? Feral hatchlings, little tinies. And we can put them under our fostered and adopted pigeons and they will raise them up. I, I have not had success because I guess I haven't had like a brooding adult couple to do, like a healthy adult couple to do that with. But I, I know that it's possible and sometimes I think we that would could, be really sweet. We could totally hook you up. Like there's some super wonderful people in Las Vegas who have adopted pigeons and they're sitting on fake eggs three weeks out of every month. Like, right. so it's they a real, as well do something. it's a treat. <laughs> they love it. They're thrilled to raise up. So if you, if it's like a certain window, right? Like if, mm -hmm. if, if you introduce the little hatchlings to the, the nesting pair, they usually take to them right away and feed them and they create crop milk. And, and it's the best of all worlds because now you've got a pigeon. Nobody raises a bird better than a bird, right? Exactly. Um, um, but if you take a, a, a nestling, you know, a two week old pigeon and you just put them in there, that's, that's not gonna work. That bird is gonna get bullied and hurt. So you have to know what you do. That's why I say pigeons are easy to help, 
but connect with somebody who has some pigeon expertise because there's these little nuances, you know? Mm. Well, this is great. Does anybody have any last questions? I just looked at the clock and realized how late we've gone. This has been fascinating. I've learned so much. Yeah. Thank you. I just, who names the pigeons in your, in your care? I, I love the names. <laughs> you know, we have a whole, so we've got about 30, 40 different volunteer fosters. Wow. And so it's a, a like I named, uh, who did I name? Um, I didn't name Willie. Willie, Willie was rescued. He, he came with his name. Um, I'm trying to think of Puffles. Do you see Puffles? I named Puffles. And that you see Puffles, that huge head, that crazy, that's called a German beauty Homer. Terrible deformity. Looks ridiculous. Bred to be like that. That's exactly, you know. So yeah, our names are all different, different. That's great. Great. I, I want to draw everyone's attention, you know, it, go check out the website. There's a ton of great information on there. To sign up for the email list. Uh, every few weeks, I, I get an email that has several rescue stories, which are always very heartwarming. And I encourage everyone to go. And if, if you can spare some money, please donate Diplomacy. Obviously, a great organization. I've been supporting them for many years. And there, there are always various matches that come up during the year. And they're, they're part of global giving. So um, I kind of think of them as a sister organization to all the parrot organizations and, and just as worthwhile. And if you're interested in adopting uh, a pigeon, you certainly know where to go to now. And they make great pets, obviously. I, I've heard great things, but now it's, you know, sounds even more exciting. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, a parrot, but without all the bad stuff. Oh, and they, they wear pigeon pants. Which is they do, they do. Avian Look. Suit. Yeah, so that's basically an avian <laughs> flight suit that we put on our parrots, but I'm guessing it's probably easier to get it on a pigeon than on a parrot. Oh, it's so easy. And there's so such... parrots do not like those. No, it's there's such good sports. Pigeons, what I always say about they'd rather be naked. But there's such good sports that you can put your pigeon pants on. We have a lot of adopters whose pigeons just, you know, they're in their nice big cage. That's their headquarters. And then when they're gonna come out, they get the pants on. And that's a fair deal, you know. The pigeons are like, okay, well, you know, I'm out and about, and um, and it is. It's very easy. They tolerate it much, much easier than parrots do. And in case it's not obvious, pigeon pants or even flight suits are there to collect the poop, so it doesn't get all over the place. Um, but you know, getting them on a parrot can be can be quite a lot of fun at times. So. Yeah, like. Uh, I yeah. only have one, uh, you know, my, my galah is the only one that will wear it and she does not like it, but she will wear it if she has to. I, Grudgingly, I'm, right? Grudgingly. I'm able to get one on a cockatiel. That's just like, no, no, that it will never happen. So, um, but so again, you, you know, you don't necessarily have to have poop all over your house. Another, another good thing about pigeon. No, uh, no, so, I'm sorry. sorry I had a question real quick. Um, so my neighbors were looking for a pet and I'm like, don't get a bird, you know, cause they've got three little kids, but you say they're really easy to care for. Do you have a class like Mickaboo has a class? Bitsy's a Mickaboo bird. Hi Bitsy. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, I wish we did. I wish we did, but we do have a lot. Of, we do kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching. Okay. We have a lot of information. We have articles that kind of walk you through all different scenarios, you know, how to, how to care for a, a, a rescued pigeon, how to create an aviary, how to welcome a pigeon into your home. So we have a lot of background, like people can do a lot of really good, um, solid, and it's, it's bird focused. It's like Mickaboo, like we're not breeders. We're not sellers. We're not like, right. you can go to a pet store and you buy a bird cage. And it's like, I wouldn't put a finch in this cage. And they're saying it's a conure cage or conure. right. Like it should be illegal. Like it's terrible. We're telling you, no, you want to, you want a pigeon in the house. They need a nice big cage. Like they, mm -hmm. that's, and they need out of cage time. So we don't have the class. We're going to one of these days we'll get there. Um, 
but we do a lot of one-on-one coaching and we have a lot of volunteers, you know, um, and our, our Palomacy help group is fabulous. And painters are great with kids. I mean, they have to be careful and respectful kids, right? you know, right. I mean, they're fragile and, um, but they're tolerant and they're not as, um, high like- Everybody says, oh, get a budgie, get a parakeet, because they're just the starter bird. Uh, yeah. they're, they're as intelligent as a macaw, you absolutely, know? Absolutely, absolutely. And, they, and, and it sounds like pigeons are intelligent too, but they're just less maintenance. And so pigeons are domestic. That's another thing. Like these birds, okay. they're domestic, right? They're, they have been, they're so habituated to humans, even if they're not socialized, they're so habituated that it's a different, you know, parents are still wild. Right? Yes. I mean, that's, yes. They're, they're not. Um, so, I mean, that's why the feral pigeons, like you can barely, you know, you walk down the sidewalk and they barely get out of your way. Cause they're like, well, eh. you know, you can vacuum, you can play music, you can turn on the lights at night. Like pigeons are, you know, they are not and people have dogs and cats, you know, um, that's not a deal breaker either. Everyone says, oh, well, I have a cat. I could, it's like, yeah, we all have dogs and cats. Like, <laughs> you know. We had two cats and two parakeets, so you yeah. can make it work. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, some common sense stuff. And, mm-hmm. but you still have to teach them to be careful around that. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. But it's, you know what, pigeons are boring. Dogs and cats <laughs> get like, they're like, whatever. I mean, they'll still go outside and chase the outside pigeons. And the indoor pigeons are like, no, I know. I, and pigeons will do wing foo. Have you ever seen them do that? <laughs> they, um, or as Dr. Spears calls it, bitch slap. <laughs> so okay. for a little salty avian vet expertise there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and, and that like, so the pigeons aren't scared of the dogs and cats. I mean, that's part of why they can't make it in the wild. Like they're, and so, the dog will come up or the cat and they'll, you know, they stand there like what? And a lot of the dogs and cats are like, okay, well, never mind, my bad. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Very Thank cool. you all. All right. Any last questions from anybody? I saw a hand from I think a Michael Judge. Was there does that sound no, like No, that was me. I'm on oh, like okay. my husband's phone because mine my battery died, so we switched over. Gotcha. Well, Sorry. thank you all so much. And thank you for taking care of your beloved parrots and these birds. It is amazing. Like a budgie is, you know, that's as much of a, of a being as any one of us. You know what I mean? There's no, uh, I don't know how they fit it all into those little bodies, but yeah, they're, they're all amazing. And I'm very happy to meet you all. Well, I'm so happy you could join us tonight and and share your wisdom and knowledge about pigeons. I'm sure it's been eye-opening for everyone here. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of parrot people don't know much about pigeons and vice versa. So I I think it's great that we can interact this way. But I really want to thank you for taking all all this time to talk to us. And uh, as said, we will be posting the recording afterwards. Um, but you. we'll, if, we'll if, share this on our on our website too. Um, we'll be very proud to share this. Oh, absolutely! And, and again, I encourage everybody to go check out the Palmsky <laughs> website. There's so much information there, and uh, you know, uh, anything you can do to help is greatly appreciated. Palmsky, of course, is a 501c3 nonprofit, so a very worthwhile organization, as as you can see. And uh, I'm going to turn the recording off now.